if you're looking for a place to hang out, figure out where you can take the next step in your dairy farming business, then you're in the right spot. Welcome to the High Performance Herd podcast. Here we will inform you what you can do today to future-proof your business for tomorrow. A big thanks to our sponsors from Terra, IDEX, Kuru Diagnostics, Taz Herd, Tasmanian Dairy Trust, Zoetis, NHIA, Data Mars. I'm your host, Andrew Savage. Enjoy this episode of the High Performance Herd podcast wherever you may be listening. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss the next episode and jump on our Facebook group, The High Performance Herd Project. Today in the High Performance Herd studio, I have Penny Clark Hall. Penny specializes in helping businesses earn their social license through a unique set of tools acquired over a lengthy career in strategic communications and journalism, as well as experiencing firsthand through these roles, New Zealand's primary sector loss of social license. Hey, Penny, welcome to the High Performance Herd podcast and tell us something about yourself most people don't actually know. (laughs) Hi, Andrew, thanks for having me. Um, when I was little and I'd be out mustering, helping dad, we all, you know, got roped into helping dad muster out the back. We're on a hill country farm. I, (laughs) I was probably about five or six and I used to like yell across the valley. I love you, Penny Clark Hall, so that I could hear the echo come back to me. (laughs) Oh, that's That's fantastic. Yeah. Are Are you saying you don't do that now? No. (laughs) <laughs> oh, maybe it should be a good a good practice for you to get into. My sister yeah. um, brought it up in my wedding speech and um, got, got a few laughs. But yeah, I used to love telling myself I loved myself when I was mustering. <laughs> oh, that's great! <laughs> wow, that's fantastic. I really like that one. Really good. Hey, you're you're through your business uh, and your daily activities. You're inspiring people within companies and businesses, and you're creating awareness and change when it comes to our social license. And through your consultancy, Social Licence Consulting, can you tell us how this journey began and what actually is a social licence? Yeah, I guess it's been um, a a bit of a lifelong journey. Like I guess I've naturally gravitated towards helping people and telling stories because I'm a a, a bit of a love bug and I have a lot of empathy. It's one of my core values. So you know, I gravitated through video journalism and the press gallery and the mo- the film industry, actually, and then eventually into strategic communications in the primary sector because my background, you know, growing up on a farm. And so that process of being in the press gallery in Parliament as a journalist and then joining our lobby group, Federated Farmers, as a communications advisor was during the time that our sector started to lose its social license. It was right at that dirty dairying campaign um, time that was created by Fish and Game here in New Zealand. So I got to see it from both sides as a journalist and as a you know lobby group communications person and what was happening behind closed doors. And over my career in the primary sector and communications, the debate around whether it social license was an actual thing or not was happening a lot and it was this gray area that I really wanted to make tangible so I decided to do my Kellogg's uh, research leadership program um, and use that opportunity to study social license and define it and understand how social license is lost but more importantly how you can earn it back And so I found out some good nuggets of information. And actually, there was a really great book published by some Australian uh, academics, which I read during my research phase. I can share um, the link with you or the title in your podcast um, chat, but that gave me a lot of really great information. Um, But essentially, social license is a measure of how much trust your business or industry has to behave in a legitimate, accountable, and socially acceptable way. So it's people trusting you to do the right thing by them, but also by the environment. That's a fantastic niche. And uh, I guess 
Kellogg is one thing that we have in common. It's a really great course and it's a really good way to get you thinking about maybe yeah, what you want to specialize in and, and where you want to become a leader. It's, uh, it's really, really good. Um, it feels like that sort of environmental and uh, well, employment pressures in particular as well, they seem to be building year on year. You have engaged with many different industries as a consultant and a keynote speaker. How does what you do then apply to the dairy industry and our dairy farmers? Because I guess you've got the industry story and you've also got dairy farmers who are you know, in their own little silos on dairy farms. So how, how does that, what you're doing, apply to, the, to us? Yeah, so do you mean like the individual dairy farmer? Probably or both, industry? I think. Yeah, I guess, okay. yeah, both, both if you're able to, just to complicate it and ask you two questions at yeah, once. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think the first thing to clarify is that social license is universal so it applies to any business or industry and that's simply because it's about trust so every business or industry needs to be trusted to do the right thing by the environment and its people right so that's why social license is so broad um, and everyone has a role to play in you know being responsible uh, for the impact that they have as a business or an industry but at an individual farm level, and I get asked this a lot because they're like, that's great, we get the concept, but what can we do on farm? How can we help improve that? I mean, they're already dealing with a lot. Um, and I always say that it, I think the grassroots approach is the most, grassroots, sorry, grassroots approach is the most powerful because that's where you create those really systemic change um, and that ripple effect. And catchment groups is my my ultimate favorite because I think that's where you are getting people together to find common ground and be and be proactive and constructive in working towards solutions. And it's where people can start to feel empowered and have some ownership of um, the problem and the solutions because I think farmers a lot feel like they're losing control and they're losing their empowerment by being um, regulated so heavily and this is a way that they can take some of that control back and actually show people what they're doing but it's also a way to build a positive community around you that can support you through the process and reduce some of that overwhelm that's really cool because yeah you're right the farmers uh, they're price takers so they don't have a lot of control over price they're having policy thrown at them so they don't have control over policy so if you can get on board um, a local organization, a catchment group, um, your local levy paying body, whatever it may be, um, and actually start to take some ownership and, and move things forward. Oh, it's really cool advice. Yeah. And with that, we've, I guess for, for me personally, I started this high performance herd project, which is centered around the cows and sustainability and collaboration of companies as well, because we're all working towards the common goal. And what I'm really trying to highlight is how do cows interact with uh, people and technology and bringing these companies together as well. The spotlight has definitely been shone on animal welfare practices on dairy farms, both here and Australasia and around the world. Uh, I'd like to know how you've seen this animal welfare piece play out. Are we making inroads and what is yet to come? Yeah, well, I think the real signal for us here in New Zealand is that the government introduced into the Animal Welfare Act that uh, animals are sentient beings. So that means that they are conscious and can feel. And I won't get into the real detail of that because it's not my wheelhouse, but essentially, yeah, they have feelings and they are conscious beings. And so that sends a really strong signal to the industry, the direction that that's heading. And, you know, as a result of that, we now have to administer painkiller medicine when people are debudding. And it's looking like that will come into play with tailing sheep. And there'll be a whole, a whole as we've seen with environmental regulation, once the first um, hurdle or gate is opened, more starts to come in behind that as the spotlight gets shone on what's going on and where we can improve on things and also with winter grazing here yeah, we've got um rules around pugging and you know how much mud is appropriate or fair 
to uh, allow a cow to have to wade through to get to feed or shelter or water. And um, the intent behind that, I think everybody can get on board with in terms of no one wants to treat animals terribly. The whole bobby calf situation as well. It's how, how you how you remedy and improve on that and take people along with you without um, sacrificing too many people along along the way. I think, you know, there's got to be some empathy uh, and inclusion in that process rather than expecting everything to change change overnight. But yeah, that's, that's what's happening here in New Zealand. Uh, I'm not sure how it's going in Australia, but I think we're probably all going to be on that same journey yeah that's right there's a bit of a, a, a sentiment here that we kind of look across the ditch and feel like in five years time we'll be in that same position it seems to be how they tend to look at things so we we're in a unique position that we can get ahead of the game mm. which is really cool and maybe aren't being hand forced quite so much but we have I guess the flexibility and agility to uh, start to put some things in place now um yeah. Thinking well, that I really is... hope you guys take advantage of that um, because the amount of money uh, and time and energy and heartbreak you can uh, save yourselves if you can just start doing what we're doing now <laughs> and right. uh, rather than have to reach that point via regulation, keeping control of that narrative and, and holding on to that trust because you're being proactive will be incredibly powerful and save you a lot of time and energy. It's really cool. And that's partly what I'm trying to do here too, is tell the stories of these businesses that are pivoting and having a crack and, and doing some really neat things. And speaking of telling stories, like farmers have done a lot over the years. I know, especially in New Zealand, of planting riparian strips. Um, even my father was always, his his analogy was always that we are guardians of the land. You know, we're only looking after the place. And so farmers really on the whole have been on this journey for a long, long time. But sometimes we don't maybe recognize or tell that story of how far we've actually come. We're only looking at what's coming at us. So yeah, how do we do better to recognize the changes that we've already we've already made and, and tell that story and and you know realizing how far we've actually come? Yeah, and I think that's really important that we do celebrate how far we've come. However, I think we also need to be mindful of if we are doing it to try and win people over and you know improve that level of trust we have there's a whole lot of action and uh consideration and, and respect that needs to be shown before we earn the privilege of people trusting us and being willing to hear all the good stuff we're doing uh and that probably sounds a bit strange because you know, well, we are doing this good stuff and how do we show people? But unfortunately, when that trust is broken down, the audience is not receptive to receiving that. So how you how you build that trust back again, one, one is showing them, but if they're not there to receive it, that's a really tricky one. So I think, again, it's, you know, that saying actions speak louder than words and catchment groups is a really, really cool way to show show what you're doing in that sense without it being about, we have a real problem in New Zealand with tall poppy syndrome. And so as soon as you try to like broadcast or showcase the good things you're doing, everybody automatically, instinct, instinctively in their head goes, well, you're also really crap in this area. Like you don't have the right to celebrate how you know good you're doing in this space but if you can be humble and have that humility and own the things that you're not doing well you get a far more a, bit, a far better reception so I like to tell people that it's about failing failing better and owning owning it and being accountable before you can start to talk about the stuff that you're trying to do and improving on does that make sense? That oh, no, really <laughs> definitely does. I, I, I guess this is um, a bit off um, so along similar topic. I do see you know, with this world of social media too, like Facebook and Instagram, 
the LinkedIn's, but a lot of um, young dairy farmers actually jumping on there. They're really proud of what they're doing and they're putting Instagram stories up and reels. Uh, and I guess maybe 10 years ago, we were a little bit too afraid to do that because of the interactions we may have yeah. on those platforms. And there are people who maybe need you. So do you see a bit of that too, as far as um, the, the younger people coming through a bit more tech savvy and, and in this world of social media, doing a better job of telling their story about what they're up to? Yeah, I do. And I see, uh, I met an Australian guy who was over here for the Australian Rural Leadership Program, who's actually made a business for telling rural stories. So there's actually there's actually a market opening up to help farmers tell their stories better, or not better, but reach reach a bigger audience, I guess, and give them the tools that they need. And social media, obviously, is a really great place to do that. It's also a horrible place to send people down rabbit holes of echo chambers of information. So it's a bittersweet, bittersweet one, that one. But if the only people on social media are the ones that are um, telling lies or making things highly emotive uh, rather than, you know, having a balanced conversation then that does no good for our industry. So we need to make sure that we're populating that place too with with the facts and with some hearts and minds stories too. Yeah, because definitely. If you want yeah. to control the narrative or be a part of the narrative, you've got to yeah. be in there. Yeah, while well, acting in a transparent manner, I guess, or yeah. 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 And again, I know it sounds weird to say that uh, it's a really good thing to talk about what you're not doing well, but it really genuinely is a great way to create and open, create trust and open that door for people to listen to the good stuff too. You know, when people get things wrong in the media and they don't acknowledge it or aren't accountable for it, the longer the media chase them and harass them and can't move on from that story. So as soon as you are able to own that, people move on. So get it get ahead of it and just be like yeah and then people will move on and start to listen to the good stuff you've got to say yeah no that's really cool advice yeah it's it's, it's such a good tool to have for us to tell that story and I guess speaking of stories the other big pressure cooker type situation we are in at the moment is the carbon and methane situation and this has been really hotly debated uh, both here in Australia and New Zealand and around the world and sometimes farmers can just feel like they're never doing enough to get on top of what is coming at them. Are there, are there cultural shifts that we can take in the way that we speak to each other about this and, and take a balanced approach for pivoting mm -hmm. on policy and change? Because like you said, we can go down this rabbit hole of, of negativity. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And like I think it's really important to acknowledge that people that are feeling overwhelmed right now are totally understandable it's totally understandable and uh, within their rights because there's a lot that the primary sector is facing and being asked to do and the difference between a, a law firm or a, a big corporate company being asked to do that is that each individual farmer has got to do that on their own to make a collective approach whereas a lot of people from the outside look at the dairy industry and consider it as one big corporate but it's not the same. They don't have the same same resources and support around them that um, those individual farmers do. But the perspective or the culture change is totally possible to help people navigate this. And when it comes to social license and that trust, it's all about our shared humanity. So it's about putting ourselves in other people's shoes. So our critics people that don't like what we're doing or have the wrong perception and understanding and having empathy from their perspective because none of us are perfect including ourselves the farmers which we've been told a lot so I think we're kind of aware of it but we need to understand that the people that are hating on the industry or critical of it um they're not bad people they just have a different perspective to us and maybe the same values or maybe different values but it's the their perspective that is telling them that they don't like what we're doing and that's that's okay because the people that started telling the New Zealand farmers they didn't like what we were doing with the environment 
are the catalyst to the amazing advancements and improvements that we've made to the way we farm. So they have a role to play and actually it's it's a positive one. That's really powerful. Um, yeah. I just want to add though that um, those people, if you can find common ground with them, and it's not often about the issue. I, mean, I was at the Dairy Women's Network Leadership Forum yesterday and we were talking about this group, Mothers Against Milk. And I was like, okay, well, there's a whole room of mothers here too. <laughs> You know, yeah. perhaps that's something that you guys can connect with and share, you know, your common ground and then go, hey, well, you know, we care about the same things. We're all mums here. Maybe that's somewhere we could start to build a relationship from and talk about, you know, the issues and what the solutions could possibly be. Yeah, it's a real mindset piece here, isn't there, about really opening your uh, horizons to new possibilities yeah and understanding and respecting the fact that critics can make us better yeah you know? yeah and it's that's really... actually like oh you know everyone hates change right but our critics can sometimes be the catalyst for us to become even better farmers or even better people so yeah that's how you look at it i guess really really cool advice and really powerful and uh, I think maybe some people might want to push rewind and have a listen to the last few minutes again, because there's so much gold there. I'd love to know uh, from a dairy farmer who's listening to this podcast, speaking of advice, um, what advice would you have for a farmer or maybe even a service provider or someone listening to this podcast that can help them move forward? And you've probably hit a fair bit of it on the head in the last few minutes, but um, you help them move, move forward from a social context. I think the biggest thing to know is that you don't have to do it alone. You're not in it alone. And if you can find that safe space within your community and build that around you, the people that you trust that you can be vulnerable with and say, hey, look, I'm overwhelmed. I'm struggling here and start to find solutions together. And that builds a momentum and you can bring other people in and you can start to set a foundation of um, a strong community where you can start to take ownership of the solutions and work through some of this stuff. Um, there's a whole bunch of support and there'll be a lot of people feeling the same way. But yeah, I, I always say, you know, no one, we all know this, no one can solve these problems alone. So, and a problem shared is a problem halved. And social license always comes back to our shared humanity. So create, um, surrounding yourself with good people that are constructive and positive, you know, that want to do well and are doing well, but may not feel that they are. And, and building a nice culture and community around you to start to work through some of the challenges that we're facing. It's really cool. I love this niche that you're working in I can hear the excitement and passion in your voice and I reckon there's some people here who it's really really resonated with if someone wants to connect with you you're happy for people to jump on your website um, Facebook how are they best to get a hold of you and maybe connect and talk a little bit further about this yeah um, I love people that's why I do what I do and I like to believe in the the good that we all have to offer so yeah I am very passionate about it and um, I would love to hear from anybody. So I am on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram as Social License Consulting, or just at my website, which is www.sociallicense.co.nz. But yeah, I have an open door and um, it's a warm one. So come on in. <laughs> That's really cool. And hopefully one day we'll see you across over here at Tassie at a conference or somewhere in Australia because you've got so much to offer everyone really well I think our industry has a lot to offer <laughs> that's, that's cool hey just want to say thanks heaps for coming and talking to us at the high performance herd project and wish you well with all your future endeavors and hopefully we'll talk to you soon thanks Andrew yeah. thanks for listening to the high performance herd podcast Thanks to the sponsors, Fonterra, IDEX, Kuru Diagnostics, Taz Herd, the Tasmanian Dairy Trust, Zoetis, NHIA, 
data Mars. Feel free to subscribe and review the podcast, share it with your friends, the more the merrier. Jump on Facebook, search the High Performance Herd Project, and you're very welcome to join the High Performance Herd private Facebook group. If you want to see a video of this podcast, jump on YouTube or www.highperformanceherd.com where you'll see a link to these sponsors for more information and more information on the High Performance Herd project, which is a real life dairy farm, spring block calving right here in Tassie. Thanks very much and we'll see you next week. Thank you.